And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords. Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy How are Tuesday. you today? Um, <laughs> I've been better. <laughs> Silly question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be yeah. better. How about that? <laughs> I hope you do get better. I hope you do. <laughs> All right, let's jump into our keyword news portion of the day. We're going to try to clarify some of these major headlines for our listeners, uh, starting with President Yoon's semiconductor support plan. This is our first keyword of the day. Chip support. So President Yoon has vowed to extend tax credits on investments in the domestic semiconductor industry to boost employment, attract more talent, keep talent in the industry. Tell us the details. Yeah, so he was speaking during a policy debate uh, held at Song Yung Wan University's Natural Sciences Campus in Suwon. And again, this kind of uh, town hall style policy briefing, if you will. Now, Yoon announced a 622 trillion won plan to build the world's largest chip cluster. Uh, in Yongin, in southern Gyeonggi province. Uh, Yoon expects the project to create at least 3 million jobs over the next 20 years, and there would be uh, also an immediate investment of 158 trillion won over the next five years, creating about 950,000 uh, new jobs. He said the government would pour in every possible resource to win what he called a war in chips that's going on. And he also encouraged the chip cluster to um, include nuclear power plants as well to ensure that there is a stable supply of electricity to the cluster. Now, last January, the government unveiled a plan to offer large tax breaks to semiconductor companies investing uh, here at home in Korea, which are set to end at the end, uh, uh, which are set to end this year, but Yoon said he will be extending it. And now he also rebutted claims that such uh, tax credits give preferential treatment uh, to large conglomerates. He said increased mm. investments in chips will lead to more jobs and more state tax income uh, in the long run as well. So he's quelling those concerns. Mm. Uh, but there have been a lot of pledges by these large companies like Samsung Electronics to invest in this. Uh, cluster as well. So um, they are certainly a focal point when it comes to this cluster, but it's also, according to the government anyway, an opportunity for up and coming um, companies related to semiconductors to kind of uh, spread their wings in this new chip cluster as well. All right, with that, we move on to our second keyword of the day IRBM reaction. So as we covered on the program, the IRBM might not be as provocative as an ICBM comparatively, but it's still a provocation nonetheless. And South Korea's military has issued a stern warning against North Korea after again it claimed to have fired a solid fuel intermediate range ballistic missile. What's the latest, Adam? Right. So Seoul's defense ministry called it uh, a clear provocation, urging the regime to immediately suspend such missile activities. It added that uh, it said the latest provocation is a violation of UNSC resolutions that ban Pyongyang's use of ballistic missile technology. The ministry said Seoul is enhancing its ability to execute comprehensive uh, extended deterrence methods with Washington in response to Pyongyang's various missile threats. It also vowed to bolster its own response, such as the three-axis system. Uh, the military says it's closely monitoring North Korea's activities and is prepared to respond overwhelmingly in the event of any direct provocation uh, from the North. The ministry urged the regime to abandon the illusion that such provocations will protect its regime and instead to take a path that serves its people uh, and the future of the Korean Peninsula. Now, the top nuclear envoys of South Korea, the US and Japan also condemned the launch. Um, now, the IRBM equipped with a hypersonic maneuvering warhead, as claimed by the North, powered by solid fuel, uh, does indicate, if true, significant advancements in the regime's missile technology. Now, this development raises concerns, of course, about North Korea's ability to conduct surprise attacks and potentially uh, evade existing missile defense systems. So, yes, the severity of it is somewhat uh, subdued compared to an intercontinental ballistic mm. missile, but the capabilities that mm, the North mm. is touting in terms of this IRBM uh, is of a fresh concern for mm, South mm. Korea uh, and the US. And, of course, uh, they will most likely... Uh, respond in kind with more weapons developments uh, themselves. Uh, South Korea as well is trying to, um, you know, up its game in terms of the spy satellite technology and mm. its uh, rocket systems as well. So 
Yeah, so room for more tensions, unfortunately, uh, along the Korean Peninsula. And here's another uh, particular area of concern. Increased military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. The four ministers of the two countries are sitting down again for talks. Our third keyword of the day. North Korea-Russia meeting. So North Korean Foreign Minister uh, Choi son has arrived in Russia for a meeting with a Russian counterpart, Minister Sergei Lavrov. The meeting is sparking concerns of further arms trade. What's the latest, Adam? Yeah, so we don't know too much about uh, what's going on there at the moment, but we do know that she has arrived in Moscow and her visit appears to be a reciprocal trip following Lavrov's visit to Pyongyang uh, back in October. Now, the Kremlin said Russia will develop ties with North Korea in all areas, building on agreements between their leaders in September. It added that the North is Moscow's closest neighbour and partner. Uh, The Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said dialogue between the two nations will continue on all levels, not ruling out a possible meeting between Che and Vladimir Putin as well. Now, Peskov was also quoted as saying that Moscow hopes for a visit by Putin to North Korea to take place in the foreseeable future. He added that further coordination, including its timing, will be discussed through diplomatic channels. Now, whether Cho will discuss that matter with Lavrov as well remains to be seen. Uh, The North State media reported that the meeting comes as the two countries deepen economic, political and military ties. Does that mean that they'll be exchanging more weaponry uh, as well? And of course, Cho's trip does come amid suspicions that North Korea has provided weapons to Russia for its uh, war with Ukraine in return for Russia's technical assistance for Pyongyang's weapons programs as well. There's been claims that uh, Russia has helped North Korea in its most recent spy satellite launch as well. Uh, But of course, Pyongyang and Moscow have been denying any arms deals so far. But uh, the evidence, uh, according to foreign media reports and foreign governments in the West, uh, Mm -hmm. say otherwise. And we mean, we talked about the U.S. intelligence report showing, uh, you know, pictures, proof otherwise, uh, showing uh, Mm. Russian art, well, North Korean arms being uh, utilized in the war front in Ukraine. So how about that? But seriously, keeping tabs on increased military cooperation between the two countries. We'll leave it there for now as we move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Credit amnesty. So two and a half million people with a history of loan delinquency during the pandemic will be given the opportunity to switch to low interest loans through a credit amnesty program. So give a little bit of breathing room because it's really the odds being stacked up against you time and time again. You have bad credit. It's hard to get loans. You're in a bigger rut. Tell us the details. Yeah, so your credit score does go down even if you pay off uh, the loans eventually. But if you do have a record of arrears, Mm. then they do remain in place. Uh, Say that you have had a record of being late uh, in your loan payments. And of course, uh, during the pandemic, when loans were uh, taken out by a lot of these small business owners because, you know, it was tough times, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, that kind of leaves a stain on their credit rating. And so it's hard for them to get any loans now when they uh, need it for say business expansion or any other business needs now more than a dozen credit bureaus signed a joint agreement to support credit recovery for the uh, vulnerable and small business uh, people this program will delete delinquency information for those who repay their debts now under the agreement if delinquencies of less than 20 million won that occurred between September 1st, 2021 and January 31st of this year are fully repaid by the end of May. The sharing and utilization of the delinquency information will be restricted as early as the beginning of March. Now, the financial sector plans to limit the sharing of delinquency information among financial institutions and not reflect it in the credit evaluations of individuals and sole proprietors. Now, for their own customers with delinquency records, financial institutions plan to reflect these records positively in credit assessments. It is estimated that the sharing and utilization of these short and long-term delinquency information for about 2.9 million individual borrowers will be restricted under the plan. Specifically, the credit scores of about 2.5 million people are expected to increase by an average of 39 points, allowing them to switch to low interest uh, loans. Of course, you need a good credit rating to get lower uh, interest rates uh, for loans. Additionally, after credit recovery, an additional 150,000 people are also expected to meet the minimum 
credit score criteria for uh, credit card issuance as well. So, yeah, this is something we mentioned before on the program as well, but uh, some more details on it coming mm. out and more people um, two and a half million people, uh, to be precise, uh, are eligible for this kind of credit amnesty to give them a better chance in taking out uh, loans and uh, when they need it. New year, fresh slate, that kind of approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our final keyword of the day. Gaza conflict. So intense fighting continues in the Gaza Strip as Israel and Hamas marks 100 days since the conflict began. I can't believe it's already 100 days in and this is at the loss of too many, just too many casualties. What's the latest, Adam? Right. So uh, despite U.S. pressure uh, to reduce the intensity of military operations, neither Israel nor Hamas are showing any signs of backing down. The Palestinian casualties have reached nearly 24,000 and the fate of over 100 hostages remains unclear. Uh, Middle Eastern anti-American forces, including Iran, have intensified their criticism of the U.S. Uh, The crisis continues not only in the Gaza Strip, but also near Israel's northern border Uh, and the Red Sea. Uh, Israeli tanks and fighter jets attacked multiple targets in southern Gaza, and the Israeli military claims to have destroyed several Hamas missile storage uh, facilities. Communication and internet services in Gaza were disrupted for the third consecutive day, uh, hindering rescue operations for the uh, injured. Uh, now, Hamas reiterated, retaliated rather by firing rockets towards Ashdod in Israel, about 40 kilometers from the Gaza Strip. However, there were no reported casualties. Now, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has dismissed uh, international calls for a ceasefire, even from um, close ally uh, the US. He said in a televised address over the weekend that the war against Hamas would continue until the end and until total victory. What he deems as total victory remains to be seen, but those were his words. Now, analysts and military officials in Israel have said the conflict could continue uh, for many months, uh, even a year. Uh, probably longer at that. Uh, On the other hand, Hamas is not also showing any signs of backing down as well. So just pointing to more signs that this conflict will be prolonged. Uh, The potential for the Gaza conflict as well to escalate in the Middle East to other areas remains a concern as well. There have been clashes between Hezbollah, pro-Iranian armed faction, and the Israeli military along the northern Lebanese border of Israel as well, Mm -hmm. exacerbating the already Um, tense situation. Of course, there's been the recent Houthi attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea uh, as well. So there's just uh, Mm -hmm. too much conflict going on in the Middle East um, at the moment, uh, which is, of course, uh, a cause of concern, not just because of the casualties, but in terms of economic repercussions Mm -hmm. as well. So uh, in terms of oil prices and whatnot and other commodities spreading worldwide uh, is, of course, concerning. All right, we'll keep tabs on those stories. Thank you very much, Adam, for today's coverage. Thank you. Stay safe. (laughs) We'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) You're very welcome. I'll see you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.